Welcome everyone to this awesome Medscape live event. We're in the Medscape studio in New York to answer burning questions that everyone's asking about the realities of medical school. I'm here with a powerhouse panel of guests that are going to introduce themselves, but throughout the next 30 minutes, make sure you comment, ask questions, and get involved because we're going to be taking your questions live. My guests are going to introduce themselves and then we're going to get started. My name is Kim Ashieri. I'm a neurosurgery resident in New York City. Hey, how's it going, everyone? My name is Neil Bobsar. I'm a Medscape contributor and a second year medical student at New Jersey Medical School. Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Rascala. I am a third year medical student and I have a YouTube channel titled Dr. Disney. Dr. Disney actually wins best nickname of the day. Thank you so much. And my name is Dr. Alok Patel. I'm a pediatric hospitalist here in New York. We have a lot to cover, and we're going to jump right into our very first question from Faith, which is actually an interesting one. Faith asks, the medical school reputation, does it live up to the hype? Is it really that tough? So I don't really know what reputation she's talking about, but I want you guys to give me your interpretation of that and tell me if you think it's that tough, medical school. So medical school was tough. I think the transition from going from medical school to residency might be a little bit tougher, but I'll let these guys take that. <laughs> That's scary. Uh, for me, medical school, I think it's definitely not easy, but it, I think it's gotten a lot easier since uh, first year for me personally. I think the transition from college to medical school was definitely difficult. I think the volume of material was a little scary, but now that I'm in my second year, I still haven't taken my boards yet, so you know, don't really count on me, oh. but it's gotten a little better. I think I've gotten used to the material. I know how yeah. hard things are usually gonna be, but I think Peter can be speak more on that. Yeah, I mean, I so it gets better, like the transition from Pre-med to medical school is difficult, but it gets better. I will say that it's not necessarily hard, it's just there's a lot of material, and I don't think it's structured optimally. It's almost like they're taking a thousand darts and just throwing it at a dartboard and hope something sticks. Yeah. Like I had a, a professor who said, if you graduate medical school knowing 10% of the content we taught, then you're doing well. So like it seems like they just hope that something <laughs> sticks. Uh, this is not it's public inspiring. information. Yeah. <laughs> now, everyone's gonna be like, I'm gonna fail 90% of no, medical no, no, school. No, 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 yeah, do your best away. for sure, but like, <laughs> It's, it's a lot of content. Well, here's a personal question for me. Um, to you guys, so when I was in medical school, there was not really a big YouTube education yeah. presence. Like, people weren't able to go and look up, you know, these great respiratory videos and yeah. cardiovascular tutorials, things like that. Do you guys utilize those nowadays? Absolutely. All these digital health tools. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Apps. To be I, honest, yeah. So I learned yeah. EKGs with a YouTube video. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we had that orange book that I know some of my older audience members know about. I mean, for me, I think I think right now we're like in an age of like the golden age of medical student resources. There's mm -hmm. so many resources coming out that it's a little inundating for me at times. There's sketchy medical, there's pathoma, there's first aid. I could list off like 20,000 things. And uh, as a medical student, it kind of comes down to you to pick which one works best for you. And sometimes uh, that's a difficult decision. For me, I had to be honest and maybe find one or two that I use every day. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of students out there that are always struggling with, oh, my friend's doing this, my friend's doing that. Which one do I pick? And honestly, it's, it's a little scary. Yeah, I, like to say. I will say that it's gotten to a point where there is a lot of content, but in terms of like free content on YouTube, like I'm also on YouTube, so I consume a lot of the content that's there. But like Osmosis has like videos that are really good that are like super focused for medical students. Um, there's like Khan Academy Medicine now. Like there's so much available, um, and it's kind of good because if one teacher doesn't explain it in a way that you get, you can always go to a different yeah. video. Whereas in school, I guess back in the day, you're just like. You have one professor or one textbook. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this youthful face. But I feel Five like every day there's someone else like peddling a product on Instagram saying like, yeah. use my code for 10% off. Yeah, those target but ads. Enough of that. <laughs> Great question from Daniel Roman. How many hours a day do you actually study in medical school? And then I have a follow-up one for you, <laughs> Missy. In medical school, like how many hours do you actually um, study? So in third year, it's kind of hard because I think the expectation is you are not a full-time resident, but almost a full-time resident. Um, like you're expected to come in when they do get sign out and stay until sign out. And then you have to go home and study. So usually in third year, it's like two to three hours a night, if that, because you're just drained. You're trying to shower, eat, sleep, maybe do something fun so you don't go crazy. So Get the shower, dude. <laughs> um, I'm trying not to kill some people with my smell. Um, but yeah, I think... Second year is mostly where it's at. Uh, yeah, second year I'm studying like, you know, 13 hours a day. I'm like going into a library. No, I like, not, that's not real. I, <laughs> I study probably like 
I want to say maybe, I want to hit at least four hours a day. There's a book that I read or audio book that I'm listening to by Malcolm Gladwell talking about 10,000 hours. And one thing that I took out of that was that to be an expert in anything, you spend 10,000 hours. The book's called Outliers. It talks about 10,000 hours. So I did the math and I thought maybe if I study around three and a half hours every day or four hours every day, I'll be an expert in medicine. I don't mm. want to, I use that term loosely. I'm mm -hmm. a medical student. I don't know anything. But uh, <laughs> I just want to say like spending four hours a day seems like a solid, reasonable amount. If I can do more, that's great. If I can't, you know, I can take a nap and just play Halo with my friends yeah, or something, yeah. you know. Malcolm's sending you royalties right now. <laughs> um, and Kim, so follow-up question, because I know in medical school everyone says, oh, you're going to study so hard, and then lifelong learning. But you're a neurosurgical resident. You do not get long days off. I would just, a, a butterfly once told me that. <laughs> do, you, do you actually find time in the week to read journals and keep up on outside research in addition to residency? Yeah, so, you know, playing off of what Peter said, it can be really difficult when you're working these long days, you come home, you're exhausted, mm -hmm. you kind of just want to go to sleep. Um, one of the nice things is we, we have built in ways of getting that journal reading exposure. We have actually a journal club that meets monthly, so you're automatically going to be reading at least one article a week, more or less. Um, but also, you find that a lot of your learning in residency is done on the fly. Mm -hmm. As you're seeing consults, before mm -hmm. I go down to see the consults, I'm whipping out a book and reading about you know, what it is I'm going to see and what are the best practices? What do I need to work it up? What, do I, what am I worried about? What, what do I do to treat it? So your learning is sort of built into the process of being a resident. I think you nailed it. So I mean, even I was like really resonating with what you said about having it integrated because, you know, as a pediatric hospitalist, we don't always have time to yeah. tell someone to like <laughs> skip lunch yeah. or, you know, go home later and read. So you just gotta have to get it in when you can, yeah. like attending those lunch conferences. But everyone has a similar experience of spending a lot of time studying or working or whatever. So I think Leone Callis, sorry if I mispronounced your name, <laughs> Leone Callis has a phenomenal question that basically everyone watching us right now is like, when are they gonna get to work-life balance? So her question is, how do you balance work and life? Yeah. And what does that mean to you? Yeah, so it can be really tough. And what it means to me is choosing the things that are important to me outside of work and really focusing and making a pointed effort on doing those things. So even when I'm tired, when I have a weekend off, instead of sleeping all day, I get myself out of bed and I go and see my family or, you know, I go to the gym or I go spend time with my friends. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that I've committed myself to doing that day, I just make a point to do it. Because otherwise it's so easy to just get kind into of, the cycle. Yeah, yeah. And just let it slip away. And it's really important for your mental health while you're working that hard to have an outlet. Gotta be a person. Yeah. What about you guys? Work life. Um, I will say that uh, very young, like everyone says, time management, time management, especially at like pre-med, you're like building up. But one thing that I told myself I'm going to start doing is to stop saying I don't have time um, because we all have the same 24 hours. We just prioritize differently. Um, so I have been like more conscious about things I spend my free time doing. So if I do have time, I either spend it with family or friends or I go make like a video or like spend it doing things that I like to do, which is like creating content or like being fun and uh, like whimsical. Whereas some people don't realize they spend a lot of time like on Netflix or like on Instagram or Facebook. Like when I would study with people, they'd be studying for like eight hours but have like Facebook open or like a soccer or football game. And it's like, like be more conscious about how you're spending your time. We'll open up ways for you to have more free time. More free time. Yeah, to jump off of what Peter was saying, I think mm -hmm. two really simple things you can do to manage your time effectively when you're studying is really just use productivity apps. I think mm -hmm. one app that I use a lot is Forest. Another thing you can use if you have a Mac is like self-control. It blocks out all the distractions. You can't go to YouTube, <laughs> so no time. Reddit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we need I, someone else to tell us to study. <laughs> yeah, like you just, as long as you can't access YouTube on your own, you're like, okay, like you feel kind of embarrassed just hitting the website and then this banner pops and saying, shouldn't you be studying? And you're like, okay, I think I let me just, should. yeah, let me just focus <laughs> right. for a little bit. And then once, you know, you put your four hours, five hours in, then, you know, you actually have a lot more time than you think. I have a few friends who've maximized the system and they just go ham from like 6 a.m. till 12. And after that, they're just relaxing, watching Netflix. So uh, it's possible. It's possible to have awesome. a life in med school. I think. I think that residency inherently makes you a more efficient person. You kind of have to And be, that right? goes for your work inside the hospital, but also your t your time management and planning outside of the hospital. So I yeah. think you just learn how to squeeze because everything it's so in much. one day. 
Yeah, you just get used to manufacturing time. Mm. I think the best app is just called Have an Indian Mother. She just like, <laughs> tells you, like, don't touch that. I but agree with that. As you guys can tell, we are being pretty candid and running with it. So ask questions, and we'll do our best to get to any of them. Chime in, make comments. You can ask something directly. You can ask whatever mm -hmm. you want. We just got another question in about what is your craziest hobby that you have not shared with people now that we're talking about work life? Quick answer. Uh, craziest hobby? When you're talking about de-stressing, we're talking about our days off. Go. Um, I guess YouTube, but also volleyball. I'm a volleyball fanatic. Volleyball fanatic. Uh, I make memes. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just love taking stress off by having a diary of memes to talk about my day and let people interpret the picture the, any way they want. A lot of SpongeBob memes. By, uh, SpongeBob, SpongeBob memes. memes. Oh my, gosh. my Instagram, if you want to see, is just all memes about med school. So it's now public. <laughs> Um, I've read every Dickens novel. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's now, impressive. that's the nerdiest thing that's going to come out this evening. <laughs> so it's so funny. You know, one last. See, it's important to talk about this stuff, right? Because you've got to be able to balance the fierce competition, right? Yeah. And I'm segueing into a very important question that Liz just asked. Liz asked, what is it like for you to be a woman in medicine? And I think that's an important question, not only for, I mean, we all want to hear your perspective, but also... I'm going to be honest, like, women owned us in medical school. Mm -hmm. There are statistics about them doing better than us yeah. in medical mm -hmm. school. They're powerhouse physicians. Um, we're not about to get very political right now, but we do know we have a lot of work to do when it comes to things like equality, right, and, yeah. and the pay gap. But I want to know, in your, in your perspective, what is it like to be a woman, not only in medicine, but also in surgery, powerhouse? Sure. Yeah, so being a woman in surgery and Neurosurgery is a sort of classically male-dominated field. Mm -hmm. um, it can be difficult at times, but I mm -hmm. think that we're actually making a lot of progress. Um, I know my program is very receptive of having females in the program. They're very supportive. And I think the, the biggest thing for me is that the other women in my program have either consciously or subconsciously taken it upon themselves to take me under their wing. And I can already feel myself doing that for my junior residents who are also female. That's and awesome. I think that is the way women have to build each other up in medicine is, you know, we've, we've got to be there for each other and do it ourselves. You've got to actually pay it forward and create the new culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen any differences in kind of females entering certain specialties or anything that you can add kind of yeah. on what Kim just elaborated I don't know. I, I get a sense of like, like genuineness when when they're interacting with patients because I guess there's like the motherly instincts come out um, so even though they are stern at times and you know they have the range of personalities there is always like a hint of like warmth behind um, interactions that I've seen uh, as a medical student uh, I'm proud to say that my med school accepted I'm not speaking on behalf of my med school but I'm just saying I'm proud to say that my med school accepted <laughs> uh, uh, more women in the entering class in mm. my class specifically I think it's like 52 percent women than nice. when compared to males so that's exciting I think you know that's pushing a trend forward and I think that's happening across med schools across the country so I'm just excited to be a part of the generation yeah. where we're seeing more equality on both sides. Yeah. Totally. I'm just, I'm just gonna throw a little endorsement in for surgery there. Even though women are making up at least 50% of a lot of med school classes, that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that they're making up 50% of surgical residencies. Mm -hmm. I see. And so I think we need to make it more accessible for women to get into these traditionally male-dominated fields. Yeah. And I feel like, Kim, you just kind of like threw this underhand for a hit into our next big topic because Kaylee just asked about goals versus finances in picking a field. And I would love for, for you to personally talk about when you were trying to choose a field. You know, people talk about goals and finances and what your life's going to be like, but you just mentioned women in surgery. So everyone wants to know, including me, we did not talk about this before. <laughs> How did you pick neurosurgery? When did you pick it? Sure. So I've actually been interested in neurosurgery since I was in high school. So I'm a little bit of a, an outlier, I think, in that oh, sense. Yeah. Um, I had some good family friends who um, were involved in the neurosurgery department, and they had me come and shadow the neurosurgery department while I was still in high school. So I sort of knew that I was interested early on. Um, and then when I actually hit medical school, I started immediately spending time with the neurosurgery department, and they were really receptive of having me there, and I just I loved it, and I kind of just ran with that. Um, but that said, that doesn't work out as smoothly for everyone, and I think a lot of times you're going through your rotations as a medical student, and you either like everything or hate everything, yeah. and it can be really challenging. And you know, ultimately, 
you do have to think about what you want your life to be like and what your work-life balance is going to be like. Um, I think that I, I tend to say I wouldn't advise people to do it for the money because mm. if you go into neurosurgery or orthopedics and you hate it, no amount of money is going to make up for that experience mm. and having to, and then you have to do that for the rest of your life. Mm. So um, I really don't think that's the right reason to go into a specialty. Um, but you know, there, everyone has their own personal experience and their own personal priorities. And you really have to be honest with yourself about what you want out of your practice and out of your life outside of your practice. Well said. Yeah. Hear that, America? A neurosurgery <laughs> resident said, don't do it for the money. Don't do it for the money. You guys, what, do you, what are your thoughts about medical students being prepared to actually pick something that governs the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, Are you yeah. given the right exposure? Do they teach you enough about what life is gonna be like in 10, 20 years? You wanna, you wanna go? go? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... Loaded question, sorry. Yeah, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, I will say that, so I'm a third year and I'm considering like options. We were talking about this earlier, like I'm questioning the residents I'm working with, like what is your lifestyle like? Cause I'm finding that I am one of those students who likes most of the fields I've been uh, rotating in, but my question now is like, do I jive with the personalities that are there? So I'm finding that with peds, I'm jiving with the personalities. But one thing that one of the attendings was like, oh, what are you interested in? I was like, well, I'm keeping my options open, but I'm liking peds right now. And they're like, I just want to let you know that peds is the lowest paying and you're going to be in a lot of debt coming out. So, <laughs> and then I actually had parents come up to me and said, you're a really nice guy. Like, don't go into peds. And if you're going to go into peds, go into specialty because loans are going to kill you. So like people are just warning ah. me about like finances now. Mm -hmm. And I'm balancing the lifestyle question versus the finances and like the passion. Also, it's daunting to think about what you want to do for 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Like, 40. I don't yeah. even know what I want to do I don't for do 40 what years. What I want to do on Friday. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Neil, uh, what about you? I mean, jumping off of what uh, Peter said, uh, a few things that I worry about is just like the future of medicine, like maybe like uh, uh, Tom and, yeah. uh, like uh, AI, AI in medicine, like Google DeepMind, IBM Watson. How are they going to affect different fields? I know like it's kind of far in the future, but I'm just worried like, will there be a job or will there be a space for me to work? And I think one of the best places to get this information might be uh, Medscape, because they have a, uh, you know, wink, wink. Not Glad and Medscape. Not Glad and Medscape, Medscape. They have uh, a lot and of- And Google DeepMind, whatever yeah, the hell Yeah, and Google too, yeah. Uh, there's uh, there are a few reports on Medscape that I actually look at sometimes just to see how each specialty kind of feels. And I was lucky to shadow different attendings at my medical school and actually ask them questions from based on these reports that I saw and kind of figure out what I value in mm -hmm. a career. So, I mean, right now I'm interested in a lot of things like emergency medicine or general surgery or just a whole host of things. But again, I'm just a med student. I don't know anything, especially a second year med student. I haven't had much clinical expertise, so I really don't want to commit to anything right now at least. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's relevant because as a second year med student, you're one and a half year away yeah. from picking, picking something. And you know, a lot of questions are pouring in right now about finances. Which, first of all, means that you guys keep asking questions because we're getting great ones right now. We're going to get to all of them. But both Tony and Jason asked about debt and job availability. Mm -hmm. And Peter mentioned pediatricians not bankrolling and driving yeah. Aston Martins. I'm a pediatrician. Publicly, I owe the government $200,000. Am I going to pay it back anytime soon? I have no idea. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Mike, win the lotto. The, the, question, <laughs> the question from Tony is, are you afraid of debt? And then Jason's question is about job availability. And I feel like in some way they both go hand in hand. And you were mentioning not picking a field for the money, because if you did and then you couldn't get a job, you know, you're in trouble anyway. Yeah. But so were you afraid of debt going into it? Was it, was it, was it something that, that factored into your decision? So I wouldn't say I was afraid of debt, but I'm also speaking from a little bit of a biased stance because I don't worry that when I graduate from my program that I'm going to have a difficult time paying back my debt. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, debt is a real thing during residency and seven years is a long time to be in debt. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have to factor that in uh, when you're thinking about the specialty that you're going into. But ultimately, if you love something and you're committed to doing it and it's what you're passionate about, I think you should still go for it. 
<laughs> you can go first this time. Okay. I, I, I mean, but you're a second year who hasn't been told anything about money, right? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a second year, no one really tells you about money at all. I think uh, the only thing you're told about is really just step one. Yeah. And, yeah. Which is and, fair. And that's, that's the only. It's important. Yeah, I, I, I think so. <laughs> based on what they told me, um, that's really the only thing in my mind right now. I feel like debt is something. Maybe I'll consider third year, fourth year. To be to be frank, it's really not something I think about often. Mm. Yeah, so I think I need to change that, but I'll, I'll see how that goes. I'll just, you know, get like a 275 on step one first. And then <laughs> just, there we just, go. you know, like, <laughs> um, regarding debt, I am not afraid of it, but I will say my thoughts regarding it is like, I question why medical school is so expensive. Yeah. Um, so like, my question is like, why, like the thought is, why isn't it more expensive? Like, how do they get to the number that they pick? Um, and also like, step one is really expensive and step two and step three like what's stopping them from making a step four or step five like they could put as many hurdles and we just have to keep paying um, because they just like dangle our license or degree so it's just like I, I'm not afraid of it like if it costs this much then yeah I'll pay it but I'm just like does it need to cost Actually, this much? Actually to jump much? off of that uh, one of my friends I was talking to was like oh I heard fourth year is super relaxing in medical oh, yeah, school yeah. you're just applying and yeah. all that stuff and then uh, he was like, yeah, I'm actually angry about that. I was like, why? He's like, we're paying tuition for a full year of kind of just interviewing and relaxing. And I was mm -hmm. just well, like, Well, not only oh. that, you're also paying for flights. For flights. And, you're yeah. and hotel yeah. hotels. Hotels. Yeah. And, yes. and the application. People people actually take out additional loans it's just wow. to interview okay. it's really during yeah. fourth year. And so, you know, on our next live, we could have a 17-hour live. <laughs> and I will talk all about yeah. the hidden costs of being a physician in this country because there. Every other field gets their flights paid for. Mm -hmm. They get hotels, they get oh, redeemed. We pay for that. everything. Step one, step two, <laughs> step three, your license, your DEA. Basically, if they can squeeze money from you, they will. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> I hate to even go into that. And so, I, I, it brings me to this whole level of kind of like our expectations as a physician and what life is really like. And Sherry asks, are you concerned about the level of depression among doctors? Debt has been cited as one of these contributing factors. You know, there's a lot of other ones. We've kind of touched on work-life balance. You know, we are talking about finances, and we're talking about, you know, being able to separate yourself and your mental health. It's yeah. a huge topic, but mm -hmm. are you guys concerned? And are we doing enough? You know, I know that programs have wellness. They have mindfulness. People do have, you know, counselors you can go and speak to. Things have changed a lot in the 10 years yeah. since I started medical school. Mm -hmm. We had a couple people they could talk to. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't as much awareness as there is now. Yeah. Love to hear your guys' perspective on this. Yes. I'm extremely concerned about the level of depression in medicine. And I think that we're taking steps in the right direction. As you mentioned, many programs, most programs at this point have wellness counselors and um, people that you can go to. Even the program directors themselves generally are an open door for people when they're you know, feeling the stresses on their mental health. However, I think what it really is going to take is a culture change for the residents mm -hmm. themselves to actually feel comfortable utilizing those services. I think getting people- <laughs> Rise up. Even if you have the services there, you have to get people to go. And yes. I think that, that is the issue. It's this, we need to remove the stigma. Yeah. Doctors yeah. are allowed to be yes. human, right? Like mm -hmm. you can, I don't know if you guys have felt that. And I feel like in a sub eye, if you complain or if you're tired, it's ooh. like. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think uh, um, most medical schools have services for students, like mm -hmm. uh, student wellness, but there's such a huge stigma. Mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of medical students do go through, I don't know if depression, but general anxiety disorder. I think anxiety is a big part of being a medical student. I think you need to be worried about exams and having exams every two weeks, knowing that, you know, if you fail one exam, you're going to be pushed back a whole month or yeah. some sort of like serious consequence. So I think in medical school, a lot of students go through generalized anxiety disorder. Some students have depression. I think they do reach out these services, but no one talks about it. It's yeah. not really a conversation that anyone wants to have because they know that if they start that conversation, it's going to be following them throughout medical school. It's a small group of people and uh, there's not much to talk about. So yeah. I think people sometimes give way to conversations that might not be beneficial for everyone. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've talked a lot with my friends about it because we're getting into the phase of like considering residency um, and the conversation is usually like no one likes the thought of residency because every, all the residents we work with are essentially depressed um, and, or if they're not depressed they're like hiding their depression because um, they're just I, it's not I because they're like agree with that I mean not, not everyone <laughs> but, not everyone but like it just seems like everyone's so tired like they're overworked and um, I actually talked with one of the attendings who's she's getting her MPH now 
Um, and I was like, so residency, like, it seems like there are a lot of, like, physician suicide and, like, residents who are taking their lives, unfortunately, and on top of the depression rates. Um, and she was like, yeah, I mean, I didn't like residency, but, you know, it's just something you have to go through. <laughs> so, like, in my mind, I was like, I studied public health in undergrad, and we, like, find ways to prevent illness. And for her to, like, be in this degree program, but to still excuse the awful culture that some residency programs like nurture um, or just have ingrained is, is just alarming. Um, so that's, I know a lot of us talk about it, but I think as students, we need we to try, be part of the movement. We have to be part yeah. of the movement, but as students, I don't think we feel encouraged to just because you never know who's listening and like we're at the bottom trying to like apply and stuff. So we don't know, we don't want to shake any. Well. Yeah. Well, no one's listening right now. <laughs> Except for our live audience. You guys were get, obviously getting real right now. That's fantastic. So keep your questions coming. And also, I promise, being a doctor kind of rules. Yeah, yeah. Even though yeah, we're, yeah. we're just yeah. being honest. So, yeah. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> you were gonna so say So going back to your, yeah, yeah. your point, I just, I, I feel like I have to say, yeah, yeah. being a resident is tiring, but there is a huge difference between being tired and being depressed. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes when I am the most tired, I feel feel the best about what I'm doing. Yeah. I feel like I stayed late and I helped this patient right. and I saw through their care you and feel that fulfilled. feels yeah. the best. And mm -hmm. so it's not always a correlation between yeah. tiredness and being overworked right. and feeling depressed. Let's get a microphone so Kim can drop it. Just <laughs> yeah. Good, uh, so we're gonna switch gears and get to a fun question, which might wind up not being fun. Paul asks, what is one thing that caught you by surprise as a physician. And Paul, <laughs> I will go first and be kind of quick. What caught me by a surprise, literally on like day one of residency, is that it's a translation of medical information to a bunch of things that are not exactly patient care. Like you are a lot of charting, a lot of talking with you know, care providers, team integration. These are all like vital, important, mm -hmm. vital parts mm -hmm. of healthcare, but I didn't realize how much I would be doing that was outside of actual direct patient care. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop there because I don't want to bait any of you. <laughs> Surprise you. Um, you say you don't want to bait me, but you, you did. Um, <laughs> I, I felt like as an intern, I walked into intern year and I thought to myself like, oh my gosh, I am a secretary. What did I do with my life? And it gets better. Um, <laughs> but that was definitely surprising how much time I'm spending on the computer writing notes, documenting every telephone conversation I have with my patients, you know, just the amount of documentation is just vast and it takes vast. up so much of your time. Yeah. And I was not at all prepared for that. I thought I was going to go in and just be saving just patients sh 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 and, just you know, <laughs> and that's not, not exactly how it goes. <laughs> yeah, what surprised you the most, but we'll go with medical school, like what surprised yeah. you? Uh, for medical school, when I walked into medical school, I thought, you know, I, I was I was like the big guy on campus. I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna learn so much <laughs> medicine. I'm gonna help so many people. Whenever my parents need anything, I'm like, yeah, I got you. Diagnosis of diagnosis. Uh, that's nothing like it is at all, at least in the preclinical years. I just remember, like, my parents were like, oh, he's pretty much a doctor now. And all my family from India is calling me, and they're like, hey, like, you know, I have this on my foot. What is it? And I'm just like, uh, look, I'm in, like, pulmonary right now. I can tell you what your FEV1 might be. <laughs> like, I, I just feel like as a medical student, you come in with such high expectations to learn and, like, actually apply these skills. Mm -hmm. And I realize that, you know, that it's a career. <laughs> you yeah. learn how to apply over yeah. time. But right now, I can just state random facts, and I'm hoping that it kind of multiplies into one solid thought. But when I go home and my parents ask me questions, I feel kind of guilty. I feel like, oh, I can't really help you right now. I, I, I really, I think I know stuff, but... It's only like rare diseases in like endocrine, like mm -hmm. uh, like GI is already like in the in the back end for me. That was like last month. So medical school, uh, I learned a lot of cool things, a lot of pathologies. But at the same time, it's really hard for me to make that translation to what I thought would be a lot easier when I came in. It'd be so awesome if your mom is like, hey, your uncle in India has a question, and he's like, how do you calculate an FEV1? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got you. Whoa. <laughs> Peter, what about you? Um, I think what surprised me most was the job prospects. Like, when we are in rotation sometimes, like, you go to, like, different specialized people. So, like, when I was on OBGYN, we went to a, uh, an infertility clinic, and there are doctors working there. When I was on PEDS, we went to um, a center for cerebral palsy kids, and it was just, like, fascinating that doctors work everywhere. Um, like you can work on a cruise ship, you can work in Disneyland as a doctor. So there's the doors only open after you get this degree. So I, I just didn't realize how vast the prospects are. How vast, yeah. So we're gonna get deep really quickly. Because Patty asks, 
Are you grateful about the path that you're on besides healing? Are you grateful for the path? And the reason I said we're going to get deep is because my answer came after like five years of interviews and reflection. So for personally, when I say am I grateful for the path, this is the weird philosophical answer. I feel like medicine is one of, one of the fields where you can see someone on the worst day of their life and then literally see someone else on the best day of their mm-hmm. life. And it's like this raw look into the human experience that I don't think you, I don't know if many fields get that. You know, for me to be able to, we're getting morbid, Facebook Live, we're getting morbid. But for me able to, to say to someone, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do for your toddler, worst day of their life, heartbreaking. To be able to say, like, you're good, you're going home, you can live a full life, best day of their life. So for me, that, that kind of glimpse into the human experience for me is hands down the most rewarding thing I've experienced in medicine. But I kind of want to hear your thoughts, reverse order. Outside. I mean, even as a medical student, you're getting exposure. So are you grateful for that process? I am. I think one thing that makes me really grateful at the end of the day is like as a medical student, you have the most time on the team. So you really get to sit down and like talk to these families. Um, like today I was speaking with a family and I realized that the mom that was in the room only like spoke Creole. And then when I was talking to the residents, I was like, hey, we should get a translator for the, for the mom. And they were like, oh, great point. So like these things that just get lost throughout everyone's busy day, like as a student, you can pick it up. And you're just like, wow, that was great. Like if you catch a social thing, the doctors will like give you a thumbs up and you're like, I'm contributing to this team. And like, <laughs> you yeah, you get like such yeah. a great sense of, which is like, goes back to the other thing. You might be tired, but the fulfillment of like impacting someone's life in such a positive way is, is like nothing else. Uh, to build off of what you guys just said, you know, I'm usually studying all the time. I'm not really seeing patients, so I can't go as deep as you guys. But one privilege that I think I have um, is just as a first generation immigrant being in medicine is just so amazing coming to America. Well, I was born here. My parents came to America and just being able to. I was like, what up, Eddie Murphy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, born in Edison, what's up? Uh, my parents uh, back in India were nurses and doc- my dad was a homeopathic doctor and then. Uh, coming to America, they can't really practice here. So my mom works uh, in the postal service. My dad, microbiologist, and it's just so heartwarming for me to actually be their American dream. And like mm-hmm. being a physician is something I always wanted to do. And then hearing from them how like back in India they had to like pay like admissions counselors to just even get an interview, and how it was a little like tougher over there than it is here. Uh, here, you know, if you work hard and you put the efforts in, and you really just show up and do the hard work, you really have a good chance of making a life for yourself here. Yeah. And I think that medicine kind of embodies that: just work hard every day, study every day, just put the effort in, see the patients, learn the pathologies. I think that's something really unique uh, that I found in medicine, and I really haven't experienced much, but I'm really, really blessed to be here, and I feel really privileged, and I'm really excited to just contribute to the field of medicine as I go on. Mm-hmm. So Shoot, I, have, I want to go back to med school now. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two answers. The, the first is that, you know, I'm grateful that I have a job where I can go every day and learn something that I'm excited about. And I genuinely feel excited about learning things within neurosurgery. And I think that's something that not a lot of people have at their jobs where they go in every day and they're like learning something completely mm-hmm. new and wonderful. Um, and the second thing that I'm grateful for, and this sort of plays off of your point, is that I'm just grateful for how open and honest our patients are with us. You don't, you are a complete stranger to your patients, and you walk up to them, and within minutes, they're telling you the most personal things about themselves, their stories, their lives. They'll cry with you mm-hmm. within minutes of you meeting them, and I think that is such... It's honest. It's, it's an honest, it's and it's a very unique experience, and I'm just so grateful that our patients are allowing us to share that with them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, so I There's think a mood. I think we've proven yeah. uh, the midst all the turmoil and the stress mm-hmm. and the lack of sleep and the debt and all this stuff that there's still like there's still light, yeah, right? Yeah, and there's sure. still like it's a great field to be a part of. And so hopefully, everyone watching that is considering <laughs> going to medical school is now gonna like break into their MCAT book. <laughs> Every medical yeah. student's fired up. Residents know that there's life after, and then the, mm-hmm. you know, attendings that are in debt like me are going to find a side hustle. But anyway, <laughs> that is all the time that we have, unfortunately, which really sucks. Because yeah. I wanted to get to this question about TV shows versus reality, because they all kind of have problems with them. <laughs> but I don't want to get sued. So anyway, thank you guys so much for checking out this Medscape Live event where we're talking all about medical school. Check out our social page. Get on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Ask us questions, ask us anything you want. 
One of us will get down the answer. It's been a phenomenal time with you guys. We'll see you again. Let's keep the discussion going. Doctors for the win.